I'm Lisa Billiou and I went from housewife to co-founder of the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. The US weight loss market was estimated to be worth close to $66 billion in 2017. You know how many zeros that is? Well, that's just how much money we're willing to pay to reach our ideal weight and feel good about ourselves. But does one actually equate to the other? Does losing weight actually lead to happiness and self-love? Well, when today's woman of impact landed her first job at a keto weight loss clinic as a principal nutritionist, she saw firsthand the relationship the modern American woman had with food, nutrition, and self-acceptance, and it wasn't good. She realized that women focused more on the number on the scale to be the catalyst to their happiness and self-worth over anything else, including their own well-being. Believing that they missed their primary goal, she left the toxic environment and set out to changing that narrative. And like Tom Hanks, she went big. Wanting to alter the conversation we have with our bodies, she wrote Happy Weight. But this isn't a weight loss book, guys. In fact, it's an anti-scale, anti-diet, anti-measurement book, which is more about loving your body than it is actually about nutrition. Now a certified nutritional therapist, public speaker, instructor, food educator, and host of the podcast, The Happy Body, yes, it's safe to say she's dedicated her life to understanding bio-individual nutritional science, human behavior, and relationships women have with food and their bodies. So please, help me in welcoming the woman whose mission it is to help us break that negative feedback loop we have in our heads, whose mission it is to bridge the gap between body positivity and weight loss and nutrition, and whose mission it is to help guide women to finding their happy way, the enlightening Danielle Devalli. Hey, Hi, dear. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, your book is absolutely incredible, and what I love and where I want to start is about self-love and being the first of the year everyone's going into it saying okay i want to lose x amount of weight um, and i think a big part of it is for their own self-esteem i want to feel good about myself mm. so they set themselves a goal and they try to achieve it now i know you have very strong feelings about the number and then the scale so talk me through that and how you ended up getting to writing um the your book Absolutely. So the new year is always really fascinating to me. You know, there's these massive goals and, and they're always image driven. And the funny thing is, is that we don't even know that there's this sort of outside, you know, agenda that is making us feel as though we need to have these sort of goals to achieve. And it starts really early on, you know, through the season. And then, you know, January 1, there's that huge push of like, okay, hate everything about yourself, all of those, the joy of the holidays, you know, everything that you were having fun doing, now you have to hate yourself and you have to achieve this thing. And so, of course, it's a little bit of societal programming. And then, you know, of course, we know nutrition has gone in this really weird space. And now nutrition is specifically weight loss. You know, when people think about nutrition, they think about weight loss. And we have all this pressure about this number on the scale. But the really sad thing is, is that neither of those things have anything to do with what's actually going on inside of our body physiologically. A number on a scale has nothing to do with your health because it's literally just weight, it's gravity. It's not actually you know, what your, your genetics are, what your microbiome looks like, or what your hormones look like, or anything like that it has nothing to do with how amazing you actually are, how capable you are, you know, it literally is just a number, but we find women tying their entire worth to that digital number on a scale. And so we come into the new year every year thinking, I'm worthless, I'm, you know, I'm incapable, I'm, you know, not able to do any of these things, I can't go on vacation, don't take a picture of me, don't, you know, do any of the things that make you great because the number on the scale is gonna tell you exactly how you think you're supposed to feel about yourself, which is 
really bad. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and that's really like what I want to emphasize and I love about your work is it really is all about like how you feel about yourself. And we turn to something like diet or nutrition as a way to try and get um, to change that narrative that we have. But I think actually most times it can be the worst thing that you can possibly do. Um, and you're nodding like, talk to me about that because it is so, um, powerful the voice that we have in our head and the negative voice that we have in our head and um and if if we all think it's a number on the scale how on earth do we change that perception yeah so it's 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 hard because it's like i said the societal programming we see it everywhere before we can move into it we have to come to a place where we can understand what's actually happening and then learn to deconstruct the vision mm. you know that all of you know society is kind of catered in order to turn us into these people that are supposed to loathe ourselves on a daily basis and so once we start to take the veil off so to speak and start to see what is actually happening we see the commercials we see the ads you know on social media we start to see all of these things then we can start to come into you know inside of ourselves and see exactly what our impact is in terms of like what we're doing to create a safer space for ourselves on a daily basis. So seeing that all these things are actually detrimental to your self-esteem and then changing that. Exactly, okay. absolutely. And so that can bleed into so many different things. Mm -hmm. It can be toxic, you know, friendships, relationships, partnerships, whatever. Um, it can be just setting boundaries at work. There can be, you know, maybe a place you go to every day that you don't even realize there's shaming language used or makes you feel bad about yourself. And so once we start to move forward into those things, we can realize that all of the things that we're probably doing every day mm -hmm. is creating that negative feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And we don't even realize how many negative conversations we're having about ourselves on a daily basis because of those interactions that we're having with people. Right. And just throw your scale away. Like you shouldn't even have one. It's like, you don't need it. I'm so with you. I was the person at the age of, you know, 18, 19, that was weighing myself every single day mm. and beating myself up if the weight went up or the weight went down. And it's so true, the correlation between how obsessive I got with how I felt about myself. So the worse I felt about myself, the more I would go on the scale. The more I got on the scale, the worse I felt about myself. And so that's why I'm so obsessed with that, like that voice in your head of like, which comes first, the horse, you know, the cart or the horse. It's like, do I throw away the scale first or do I try to change the language in my head first? Or do they kind of go hand in hand? I think they go hand in hand. You got to get rid of the scale okay. because if you don't see a number that you like, it's going to ruin your entire day, your week, your month, your year. It'll create this negative trajectory. It'll change everything. And so the scale has to go until you've completely healed that relationship with yourself. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's paint a scenario. Let's okay. make up a situation. Somebody is eating really badly over Christmas. The chances that people work out less over Christmas. And so they feel probably even worse about themselves at the new year than they did before. So feeling really badly about yourself. You think it's your weight. Um, you set yourself a goal. Okay, I want to get healthy this year. I'm going to get down to X amount. What's the actual first step that you can people can do to like really say it's not about that number but it is about well-being mm. it, it's it's hard because it borderlines turning into a disordered relationship with food and the body right because to say that a food is bad is not a healthy relationship with food and then to say like i've done terrible things also it's it's kind of a, you're putting a reflection back on yourself mm -hmm. to get to a place of health and well-being we have to understand how to actually love and nourish our body in mind, body, and soul, you know? And that's the thing is that people focus on this number and that number unfortunately completely blocks them from getting to know their body for the first time. You know, we have these constructs and of course we understand how the American Medical Association works and it's like, I'm gonna spend 30 seconds with you and then I'm gonna give you a prescription drug you don't need and I'm not gonna tell you that walking in nature actually can decrease your stress levels or i'm not going to tell you that having healthy relationships with people can actually be really beneficial for long-term you know 
uh, sustainability of your health. And so there's, there are all of these things societally that we don't do, we don't integrate. Mm. So it's really, for me specifically, when I'm working with my female clients and they say, oh, I was really bad, I need to do better. And it's like, wait a second, those are choices that we're making. Like, don't, don't negate mm. the choice that you Ooh. made, right? We have to own it. We have to take the ownership because if we give the ownership away, we're never going to be able to make choices that make us feel good about ourselves. Mm. So it's it's more than just the good versus the bad, I guess. Right. You know? So what language would you use around that? Because if I was like, okay, I've got a plan. This is my goal. Um, I want to get uh, I want to feel better about myself. So mm. I'm going to eat a certain way. I'm going to change my behaviors. And I do it. And then let's say I, I slip or I choose to do something different. And I'm like, I shouldn't have done that, right? All, th all these negative, it was wrong. I shouldn't have. What's the mindset? Like, how do you talk yourself through it so that you don't use that language? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we have to stop shooting on ourselves, right? Because that creates that, that. <laughs> that, creates that <laughs> negative language. And I think once we choose, you know, once we make that ownership of choice, then we start to feel empowered. And it's, this is the thing, it's like if we wanna to continue to have that positive space, that positive mindset, mm -hmm. it takes work. We never talk about that. We think like 30 days to this, 21 days to this. And we think it's like this hard and fast and then life is gonna be perfect somehow at the end of this like, you know, salvation the world mm -hmm. is trying to sell you. But it's, it's, it's hard work every day and we have to, wake up every day and make choices to be like, I want to feel empowered today. What do I need to do to feel empowered today? Okay, so wake up every morning and ask yourself that question. Exactly, okay. and, and take time and think about what are the things in my life that make me feel bad about myself? Okay. What are the, the people in my life that make me feel bad about myself? What are the, the routines that I have that make me feel bad about myself? And once we start to internalize and take ownership over these choices, then we know that we do have a choice to feel better and that we can start to, you know, welcome all of those positive things into our life. There's no exact formula for every person, but checking in with yourself every day when you wake up instead of just grabbing your phone is the first thing mm -hmm. because that could be wired for stress. It could be your emails that, you know, turn you into this stress ball that has to go do all of these other things and then we can, you know, emotionally eat or we can have all of these other things going on and so if we really just like meditate in the morning and come into ourselves and say yeah how do I want to feel empowered today it really can help to like cascade whatever you can do in your best possible way to try and start you know today and make it different tomorrow so yeah. I love that word feel um, I'm, I use it so often now, so I try to assess, like, how do I actually feel about it? But then also knowing that sometimes I can't trust my feelings, but I do feel it. And once I've acknowledged the feeling of it, I almost then go, okay, well, sit with it for a second and then like decipher what your next move is but not letting my feelings kind of just lead me specifically into one direction without even kind of almost questioning it as well. I love that. We have to decipher that language as well. What is kind of like, and I, I don't like using the word normal, but what is your normal? Oh, I like that. You know, and I really like it when women get to that place where they are inside of themselves mm -hmm. and they know I'm feeling this way because I'm feeling insecure or I'm feeling challenged or I'm feeling like she hurt my feelings or, you know, it's the thing that, that we don't often do mm. is allow ourselves to express our emotions, be okay with what we're feeling and then actually verbalize it to another human being. Right. We don't do that. We project, we project our negativity. We get so inside of ourselves in that negative feedback loop and then we get challenged and then we project and that can come out in so many different ways, you know? And so, that's why I talk a lot about boundaries in happy weight because it's really important to know and to be able to express that to somebody else. Like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm hormonal right now and I just need you to accept that and just know that I'm, I might be you know, emotional the next couple of days, but that's how my body operates. So you're just gonna have to be okay with it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I love that so much. I, I say that to my husband a lot, like, look, I may be emotional right now, and so I just need you to give me that kind of like leeway. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I am feeling emotional, right? Like kind of owning it, saying it out loud, like you said, it's so powerful because I think that sometimes we shame ourselves. Yes. Right? We shame ourselves that I shouldn't be feeling like this. So we hide it. We like, we keep it to ourselves. But I found it so empowering to say it out loud because it's almost like then there's no like judgment. They're like, oh, okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. Now I can act accordingly. Exactly. How many awkward moments or arguments or d disillusion of either marriages or friendships mm. or jobs happen because we're so uncomfortable with talking about our real feelings. And so I really, really try and do that work as much as possible with, with people, with clients, you know, mm. through the book, with anyone I'm working with, um, even just in my personal life, because I think it just, it takes the pressure off of living mm -hmm. if you know exactly how a person is feeling because we don't read minds. If we have an expectation right. of, of how someone is supposed to treat us based off of our feelings, then that can cause a lot oh, of issues. Oh, that's interesting. Well. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, so it, that happens a lot. You know, I think that we don't even recognize is that we have expectation and other people have expectation based off of our own feelings. And if we don't express the feeling, then they won't know how to cater to us or make us feel better or to be able to relieve whatever we're feeling or dealing with that type of stuff. And, and then vice versa, the other person will put an expectation on you and, and it's just, it gets into this really muddy space. And the funny thing is, is that we can literally dissolve expectation by talking about how we're feeling in every moment. You know, it's, it's really fascinating. I had a situation happen to me once where I missed one text message from a friend. And instead of her telling me what was going on in her life, because I didn't answer that message, I was working, so I didn't see it. Mm. There was this whole laundry list backlash of how I was the worst friend, a terrible person, oh. you know, all of these different things. And it was because of how she was feeling about what was going on in her life. Right. And I was inaccessible, right? And so that's the thing is, is we have these these huge emotions, and if we don't talk about them on a consistent basis, they will build up and then they will turn into a situation like that where we will just almost vomit emotionally mm. on other people because of the expectation we have that they should already know. Yeah, you that's know? so true. And I think that if everyone just tried it once, right? I think you have to have a safe space as well, though, yes. in doing yes. that, having that honesty, yes. um, expectations with someone that you can trust to not like, go oh god you're so needy all right because that's also a fear is that you get rejected by saying your expectations out loud mm -hmm. and that's tough rejection is tough i think that's one of the the like tough love things that i have is like we have to deal with rejection mm -hmm. it's what makes us stronger it's what makes us more resilient it's what can make us you know can help us to grow as a human being and so definitely doing that in a safe space with somebody that you trust or finding someone that you can, you know, talk to your feelings about, because if we don't let those things out, it really is going to build eventually. Yeah. So. so how would you handle rejection then? Right. So let's say you're in a situation, you found someone that you really think that you can trust. You're like, okay, well, you know, um, Danielle said that I should say my expectations out loud, so I'm going to do it. And you sit there and then you get rejected. Um, how do you emotionally get through that? Um, instead of spinning it into like, well, I should never do that again. Mm. I think with that, you have to realize that if someone treats you that way, they, they don't belong in your dance space okay. because that's the type of person that if they can't accept you for exactly who you are, the things that make you tick, the person, you know, that makes you wonderful, mm -hmm. they don't deserve your time. And so that's something I really try to operate in my personal life. If, if we don't gel and you're not going to be okay with something that I'm going to say about myself, my personal feelings, which everyone's feelings are completely valid and true. Those are their feelings. So if another person rejects you based off of your personal feelings, that's not a very nice person. Mm. And so I think a lot of people don't realize that they can have toxic people in their lives without even knowing it. And so these, when we start to kind of exercise these new empowered feelings of talking about, you know, what you're going through and, you know, being exposed and feeling exposed, we can start to recognize who's actually rooting for us and who mm, isn't. I like that. So. Yeah, I actually have a quote from you that I thought was so incredible. Um, 
I am very feisty when it comes to things I believe in. So if you are ever offended, I apologize, but I also don't tolerate um, divisive behavior or indifference. So I'm, if I'm not your cup of tea, don't worry about leaving. I'm cool with it. <laughs> um, I so love that. How did you get to the point where you can write something like that with utter confidence? Um, you know, because I know that you're saying if people aren't accepting you, then they shouldn't be in your life. But how do you do that? Because that's hard, especially if you're in a negative space, you feel alone already. Yeah, we have to look to what type of person we want to be mm. and be in love with that person, idolize that person and use that person as your your mark of how do I want to feel, you know, every single day? How, what's going to empower me today? What relationships do I have to walk away from? Who makes me feel bad about myself? And, and think about this person that you want to be, who you want to become. What does she or he look like? What do they do? You know, what does that life look like? Mm -hmm. And that is what can give you the inspiration and then also kind of the moxie to get to that space. Because I was a very quiet, timid child that was a people pleaser to the max. I was the doormat in my family. And I didn't realize how much people used me, how much people controlled my decisions. And I was just literally a robot kind of waking up. Who's going to tell me what to do today, you know, or who's going to shame me today or who's going to, you know, make me feel like I can't do something today. And I got to the point where I was like, oh my gosh, like this is not the kind of life I want to live. I want to, I want to be someone who is happy for exactly who she is. How did you come to that realization? I had to kind of separate myself a little bit. I started to, I kind of like left home and moved to another mm. place. I think it's important to be able to experience a life outside of your life, mm. whether it's through a vacation or whether it's through going to a different coffee shop or something, yeah. whatever is accessible to you to see what your life could look like in a different form. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing is people, I think it's something like only 13% of a community ever leaves the community, right? If you raise your children, like only 13% will ever oh, leave. Wow. So a lot of people don't realize that their life could be different. And so there's a lot of that depression, anxiety, misery, you know, and feeling like I, I have no one, I'm so alone because we're just looking in that immediate area, but there's a whole world out there. Mm. And I think that's what people don't see. So I went to Norway when I was in high school and that was so life changing for me because I was just like, oh, these people are okay being naked on the beach. What is this? Right. Like, we don't even wear spaghetti straps in my house, <laughs> you know, when I was younger. And so I was like, wow, there's a whole world out there. And so I think it's, it's that part when you can start to see that your life could be different and you see this person that you could be. And then I had a beautiful piece of advice a friend gave me one time where she said, you know, Danielle, there's a time, a reason, and a season for every person that comes into your life. And if, if someone leaves you, it was meant to be. It opens up space for new people. And if everybody doesn't like you, it's okay because there's going to be at least one person who does. That's cool. Um, talk to me about derailers and the, ref uh, what is the word you use? I think it's um, the reflection language or the projection, um, projection language. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about that because it's a big one. Yeah. So I, I didn't come up with projection language. That is definitely a psychology term, but it is something that happens to us a lot. You know, we internalize our insecurity and before we can have those really intelligent, emotional conversations about talking about our feelings, we can kind of bottle them up and project them through a negative lens. It's sometimes it's not even a person that you know. And sometimes it could be someone that's very close to you. Like just yesterday, I was uh, sitting to a really nice gentleman next to him on the plane. Um, but I have this really orange bag that I travel with because it'll never get stolen because it's really orange, right? And he was like, that's an interesting bag. And this guy's a stranger, right? Yeah. But he's projecting the possibility that his materialism is really important to him. And so he feels out of place when he sees something that doesn't make him feel connected. So he's gonna project that onto me, Whoa. right? Did you literally in real time think that when I, you said I know, it? I know it so well now Whoa, that I so know incredible. when someone is projecting their insecurity onto yeah. me. And, and based off, I'm very observant as well. So like based off of what he was wearing and how he was talking and presenting himself, I say, okay, this is the type of person that really enjoys money and his things. 
And so that's kind of like a stranger that can make a comment like that. All right, so take me through this, because this is so powerful. And uh, so I'm going to geek out for a second. Yeah, totally. So take me through how I can assess when someone comes at me with something. What are the things that I can do to say? Because I think it's very powerful to say it's about them, not me. Like it really is um, empowering for me to understand why people are acting that way towards me. Because then I almost can feel empathy towards them instead of hatred towards myself. So teaching someone how to decipher would be such a powerful superpower to have. All right, so let's do this. <laughs> so someone says something super negative. How do I break it down to then convince myself in essence that it's them, not me? If anything negative comes out of their mouth, it's about them and not oh, you. It's literally anything that's negative. <laughs> You're like anything negative anything is about negative. them. If they're a truly emotionally balanced and fulfilled human being, all they spread is love. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I thought it'd be so complicated and you're like, well, Lisa, look, it's a 10 step process and your video isn't going to be long enough for me to explain. I love that you just like... It's so negative. easy. It's so easy. Oh. And it could come from a bad conversation they had this mo that morning that was making them feel angsty and they want to take it out on somebody. It could be a history of trauma that makes them react that way, you know, in certain ways. So, and so that is what stranger like uh, projection is like, okay. but then close projection. Ah. Now that is, that's a really tough one. And that is hard to navigate because those are personal relationships. And it could be a family member that literally was body shamed their entire life. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to raise you that way. So that's mm -hmm. a mother who puts her daughter on a diet when she's very young. I've, I've met women who were sent to Weight Watchers when they were like 10 years old. I think the average now is like, what, eight years old? Oh, it's, that, it's um, terrible. Young girls go on diet. Yeah, it's, it's really bad. They do. It's eight to 10. They're already starting with eating disorders. And so it's, yeah, it's an epidemic. It's a real problem. And so, but it comes from a generational issue. And so because of the insecurity of the parent, whichever one it is, because either parent can be responsible for this, they will use that projection, the insecurity projection, in order to shame the child or... Uh, someone in their close vicinity, it could be a niece, a nephew, a next door mm. neighbor, you know, and then you don't actually realize that someone, any shaming language or any negative comment or any projection has nothing to do with that person. And, but then you're raised with it. So then you're in your thirties, your forties, your fifties, having these real life issues because you were traumatized as a child because of mm -hmm. someone else's projective behavior. Mm -hmm. And so that does, that does take some work. Therapy is always really beneficial and being able to realize because those are ingrained conversations, right? right? It can change how you react to a person like that or someone of that sex. And so it, it can, those are a little bit more complicated, but in terms of stranger projection, it's really easy to pick up on, so. Yeah. That's so interesting. I'm literally going to default my thought process that anytime someone says something negative, the first thing I'm going to think of, it's them. Yeah, That's cool. I love that. Um, well, going down kind of everything we're talking about, like mental health in general, mm. um, I know you feel very strongly about the fact that we need to work on our mental health before we can kind of work on whether we want to lose weight or get healthy. Um, how do we start there? Like, how do we assess, is this something I need to work on, like my mental health, or can I literally just go straight to the gym and work on my body? Well, I think that's the thing is that most of us need to work on our mental health because if we look at a food as good or bad, that's okay. an unhealthy relationship with food. If we look at our body in disgust, that's an unhealthy relationship with our body that most likely came from somewhere, either society, a family member, a friend mm -hmm. that shamed us. This is why I love talking about being naked all of the time, because if we were just naked all of the time, we were okay with it. We would never have these conversations. Right. They wouldn't need to exist, right? And so that's how we- Really, you think body shaming wouldn't exist if we were always naked? Yeah, it doesn't. When we put our clothes on, somehow we're separated, somehow we're different, somehow we become hyper-conscious and aware of ourselves. Yeah. If you go to nudist communities, which I go to a nude bathhouse all of the time, mm -hmm. nobody cares. Once you're naked, you're fine. Yeah. It's like the cover of my book, those women. The first bra came off and then it was like, woo, you know, and they were all painting each other and they were all naked and it was great. Did you so, see then a change in behavior when 100%. the women got naked? 100%. Really? One of them actually has like clinical debilitating anxiety and like had to put her own paint on. But then as soon as she was naked in front of the other women, it was just like, she could care less. She was just like, I'm here. I'm naked. I feel amazing. That's so cool. Yeah.
That's why I'm naked all the time on my Instagram because I just want more people to feel free in who they are in their body. All bodies are so beautiful and fascinating and just works of art. So I wonder if as you were explaining it, you know, kind of like letting loose and like just saying this is who I am. I wonder if it's the same thing that we spoke about earlier about saying out loud your expectations and that once you can say it out loud, it becomes very freeing. Like, I wonder if it's that, like every time we kind of really own who we are, whether it's our expectations that we're looking for in a partner or our physique, um, it seems to be the result is always being free, like feeling free, I should say. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's why mental health is so important when it comes to before we want to go down a path of, you know, doing anything that has to do with changing our bodies. So talk to me about, because I know you say like, look, the thing is, is that people need to start loving themselves. How do you love yourself and still look to change? Mm. I think change is good. Right. I think it's super healthy. I think it teaches new things about ourselves, our capabilities, how we respond to different situations. I love change. It's like one of my favorite things. And so I think that to love ourselves and want to change, they mm. kind of go hand in hand because you're going to change as you change your conversations you're having with people, as you're changing mm. conversations you're having inside of your head. I mean, there's going to be change integrated into all of that. And sometimes it could mean your body gets bigger mm. and sometimes it means your, your body, you know, gets, it gets smaller. And so it's, it's about what is going to make you feel fulfilled at the end of the day. And the thing is, is that the ideal thing that people are always trying to chase when it comes to weight loss is an unrealistic number that's actually really unhealthy for their body specifically. Why do we do that? Uh, it's society. I mean, it's, it's literally in every magazine, on every billboard, yeah. you know, if we look on social media and who has the most likes, whatever, it's always going to be these like unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. And we don't live within the scope of understanding that there are different bodies out there. And I totally blame all of media for that because you don't see normal, you don't see normal mm -hmm. bodies everywhere. You see one body type, which is fine, that's their body type, but you see this one and it's a, somehow supposed to be attainable for every human on the planet, but mm. that just doesn't exist. Mm. We're not all built the same. So if we started to see everybody everywhere, we would start to deconstruct that ideal that we needed to look or be or do, you know, a certain thing. But what I find difficult is, I think we're also, we as being like um, human beings, we're the ones also dictating what we see in the media because we're responding to it. Yes. So if you have a certain physique that is, you know, like you said, it's usually a six foot woman, you know, with a tiny waist. That's typical what we consider in the world, I think, beauty in, in the media, let's say. Yes. But they wouldn't do it if it wasn't getting the response they're looking for. So we're also to blame for responding to that. Oh yeah. But at the same time, sometimes I, I really do believe we can't help what we respond to. Like, I'm married, I'm happily married, I find my husband extremely attractive. But let me tell you, if a guy walks past with a six pack abs, I'm like, oh, you know, like, I, it's, it's, in, it's nature, it's in me to look at something like that and consider it beautiful. So how on earth do we have that behavior, change it, even though it, it is us that is putting that out there in the first place? Mm. So genes have memories, right? Epigenetics, as we're mm. learning, fascinating science. And so we can actually imprint our memory and our emotion into our genes and then pass it on. And that's so, powerful. yeah, it really is. And that's, I mean, there've been insignificant war trauma and that type of stuff. We know that people still feel these, you know, past life traumas that have come from, you know, their ancestors and that type of stuff. And so it's the same thing in terms of like attraction, right? Because Attraction is, is actually at its base level, a chemical reaction. So it's based on scent, you know, that type of stuff. And then maybe um, ideological, like, you know, do we look like mates that could be together, that type of stuff. And so that goes back to the beginning of human civilization. So we can't really change how we're attracted to someone, but then there is a, a piece that is programming. And so that's where the memory programming comes in. You know, generations of being like, this is what it looks like. And it keeps being that way and it doesn't change and it doesn't falter and we don't see a new ideal. And so we can try to set 
a new standard, a new memory that can be passed to different generations. And if we try to cultivate this holistic like world view that acceptance should be all across the board, then we'll get back to that biological attraction instead of just like this whole like image based attraction. Because then at that point, it's so ingrained, we don't know what's real until we start to push those boundaries a little bit. So I love that. Yeah. And sorry, I totally derailed us. No, it's okay. Going back to the question that I'd asked about how do you actually love yourself and look in the mirror and go, you know what, you're worthy. Because I think so many women struggle with that. Like, how many women do you know that look in the mirror every single day and say, I'm worthy? Very few. Right, very few. So very I think few. that we need to change that, which is, you know, one thing I love about you. Um, but so how do you look in the mirror and say, I'm not, you know, uh, you're, you're great just the way you are, but I'm going to go to the gym and eat a different way and work out. Um, how do you do both? Because I think it's important to love yourself, but it's also important for myself at least to want to change and push and get better and improve on everything that I ever do. Yeah, this is the thing though, is you have to have full love and acceptance no matter where your body is at, or else we do create that that deconstructive, mm -hmm. like, or the destructive relationship. Like say for instance, you know, someone is on 10 different medications and they need, you know, if, unless they want to possibly die, you know, they need to make a huge change. The problem is, is that the structure that we have set up is go on this crazy diet and go kill yourself at the gym every day. Mm -hmm. they, might, they might come off their medications and sometimes people do lose weight, but that doesn't mean that they've actually made their life last longer. They could end up with another, you know, something that's really intense or burn out their adrenals or, mm -hmm. you know, do other things. And so that's the thing is to truly wake up every morning and love yourself, we have to do the work every day. And if we want to live in a healthful space where we move our body and we choose foods that are nutrient dense, not nutrient poor, there is a kind of a love that needs to come into that as well. Because, and if we don't, we get orthorexia and then we have this whole other, you know, relationship with food that's disordered. And so love has to be in every space, loving people from afar, nourishing our body, moving it in the way that it it needs to be moved not should be moved you know it's it's that's the thing is like there's all of these different facets and it's different for every person mm. too i know this is starting to sound really complicated and people are like how am i supposed to do this Danielle?" Right. it's like go on the journey yeah that is my ultimate advice is just go on the journey be okay with change be okay with you know, having a bad day and talking about your feelings, but just try and just love yourself through the whole process and accept yourself through the whole process and, and truly really try not to choose a negative idol of yourself that's mm -hmm. going to make you hate yourself to get there. You know, choose that mark of being someone that you're going to love every day till you get there, even if it's a bad day, you yeah, know? I so. love that. Yeah. Um, so going from self-love to then humble brag, oh, because yeah. I know you did a humble brag <laughs> challenge, which was yeah. so amazing because it is almost universal, at least in the world that I've lived in, almost universal that every woman I've ever met finds it difficult to talk about the achievements they've had and done in their lives, except for kids. Oh yeah. They love it. <laughs> so talk to me about humble brag and then why kids seem to be different. Yeah. So the humble brag challenge is it, honestly, there's no place in your journey. That's the right place to start at any time, no matter where you're at. Even if you just started your journey today is the time to brag about your achievements because that motion in itself is extremely empowering. I had so many people DM me that were like, Danielle, I love you, but I can't do this challenge. Oh, they were like it. It makes me feel like I didn't do enough in my life. Like they, they start to second guess ev all of their choices. And it's because we, we don't talk about the things we're proud of in our life. If you sit with women, all they're talking about is I'm ugly this, I didn't do that, I'm too fat this, I'm that. And it's just like the most negative conversation. And instead of being like, dude, I was so proud of myself. I did that thing yesterday. Did you see that? And then be like, yeah, you know, that's not happening. Right. That space is empowering, but we don't empower each other. We tear each other down and we're jealous and we think, 
I should be like her. You know, all, there's all these like really weird things happening with, with women when we should just literally be talking about all of our feelings, not care if we ugly cry in public, totally be exposed and like empower each other all of the time because that's what kids do. Yeah. They ugly cry in the middle of a grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> and then 10 minutes later be like, I got chocolate, look at my chocolate, you know, because they haven't started that shaming conversation. That's interesting. They're not bullying each other mm -hmm. yet. They're not feeling self-conscious. They're not aware that literally anything could be wrong. But then once we become really hyper aware of our surroundings and our bodies and through negative conversations of other people around us, then we literally stop talking about the things that we're good at. Mm. And then we never think we're good at anything. And then we just are miserable. And then we have these unrealistic goals of weight loss that are actually tied to years of trauma and we don't talk about it. And do you think that we should humble brag, let's say every day, so it becomes a habit of that thought process of instead of it being a negative thought process every day, if you're humble bragging, then it, you know, rewiring your brain to think positive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like if I do the dishes, I'll tell my husband, I'll be like, I did the dishes today. <laughs> and he'd be like, I saw, thank you so much. And then there's that exchange of like gratitude and excitement. That's a tiny little thing. But if we did that more like, Hey, did you see my hair? You know, I, I like it. Yeah. Or, you know, complimenting people and, and it not being a space of like, you know, that's gonna be come backed with something negative. And if we did something small every single day, it doesn't have to be physical. It could be literally anything. It could be even asking for a thank you for something that you did. And just like having that equal exchange conversation and really trying to like be seen mm. so that you can see yourself. Because I think that's the thing is we're just like coasting through this life thinking that we're supposed to get to this place mm. that doesn't exist because everyone's trying to sell us salvation and then we don't actually live our life, you know? And that's where the work comes in. Right. That's when we realize, oh, I've got some stuff. Hmm. We need to unpack that a little bit. Why is this positive thing that I, you know, should be participating in bringing up these feelings? And it brings up the feeling of unworthiness. I never said my work was easy. <laughs> I no, which, definitely. But I think that everything that if you really want to achieve in life, it's not going to be easy, it's which not. is why we probably don't have it because we have to decide are we willing to do the work or not? Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing is I do like these emotional challenges because I do like to show people that okay there's still there's something there let's work on it let's unpack it and we rarely lean on other people and say hey like i'm feeling this way or that was really hard for me or hey can we talk about this for a second you know and i i have that happen a lot in my life because i foster that mm. but there are a lot of people who feel very alone in the world because they don't feel comfortable enough talking about their feelings mm. so what other challenge did you do that you're like, oh, this really rubbed people the wrong way? Or like it was very difficult for people to do? Yeah, I did. Um, I did like a bikini challenge and it was more like everybody is a bikini body. I'm so sick of like the get your bikini body by June 1st. Yeah. It's just like, dude, just wear a bikini. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like if you feel hot in a bikini, wear a bikini. Who cares? I love that so much. And so everyone has a bikini body. Everybody does. Every body is a, you, you have a body? put a bikini on it you know it's not that hard yeah. and so um I did that and my, some of my friends were so excited mm. and some of them it was really emotional some of them didn't want to participate because they didn't feel like they had a bikini body which is just ridiculous um because everyone has such a beautiful body and so that was really exciting but that brought up a lot of emotion for mm. people so I try and throw these in these challenges in there sometimes. Um, I did a braless workout challenge because I really like to encourage like lymphatic drainage for breast health. And I was encouraging women to understand that uh, a lot of the bras that are sold commercially are actually very toxic. And we have um, in our mammary tissue, we actually have a lot of lymph drainage that's underneath the breast tissue. And so that's how a lot of our toxin comes out. The area between the armpit and underneath the breast is a very heavily, um, like an area of detox. Oh. And so we wear these toxic bras that are very tight with underwiring and it actually traps a lot of uh, the, the, the toxins that are trying to come out of the body, it recirculates them back into the mammary oh. tissue. And plus the toxic chemicals that are in most of the bras out there are just like 
really bad. Really? Yeah, really bad. In like the fabric? Oh yeah, absolutely, wow. absolutely. And so that gets into the mammary tissue as well. Cause anything that sits on our skin for 10 minutes is gonna absorb directly mm. into the body. And so we're trapping these toxins, we're adding more toxins, and then we're also not expressing the lymph tissue mm. because the mammary tissue itself does need to be expressed in order to release toxin. I mean, this is a, this is a very delicate area and breast cancer in America is at an all-time high because of a lot of large contributing factors, sure. right? Nutrient poor foods, you know, um, toxic body products. And then of course we're using these bras that are really detrimental. And so my challenges are not the light and fluffy, get the likes. They're the more like, we are really gonna have to sit and think about what's happening here, you know, and kind of internalize it and see what we learn from it, so. So you did like a whole, work out with people not wearing bras yeah and some of my friends were really into it really? yeah they like sent me all these pictures of them you know going what braless so cool. and like you know exercising braless and i do understand that is not possible for all women sure. because we do you know there are large busted women out there that do rely on support mm -hmm. and so for women like that i tell them then definitely be doing armpit detoxes using a rebounder any way to get the mammary tissue to release toxin is really important yeah. and did you see the people that were um working out without a bra it had that same effect as people going nude like that empowering it wasn't just about like oh i've released the toxins from my boobs it's like i did it yeah Exactly. I even my um, my friend Leanne Vogel, she's like big in the keto world or whatever. We did an interview together recently. Both weren't wearing bras and we laughed about it. She's like, I just don't even wear a bra anymore. I hate it. I'm like, me too. It's That's amazing. amazing. So I love that. It just it, you inspire other people around you. You know, when you do these things and they see that you're doing it and you're okay with it and it's changing your life positively, it can, it's infectious, you know? Um, one thing you wrote about, you actually put a caution on, um, I believe it was your book, where you said, caution, you may actually find yourself. <laughs> Which I loved, but explain to me why it's a caution. It's just, I think it was more of like, I wanted it to be kind of funny, but at the same time, it is like, finding yourself can be scary for people because it can change your entire life. Right. You know, if you think about it, you know, we think about, you realize you wanna be a different gender, or you realize you're married to the wrong person, or you worked your entire life for this career that makes you miserable, you know? And so it's like, there's definitely a caution there. You're gonna feel some things. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be some feelings that are gonna happen and it's gonna bring up some stuff, but in the end, it's worth it. Yeah. I have never felt happier or more beautiful or more empowered in my life um in and the me now compared to the little me you know we're totally different people and i'm so happy i did all of that hard work to get to where i'm at now because then i can look forward in my life and know like hey i was i was aware i was conscious i did something i took action and now i get to live this life that makes me feel really fulfilled oh i could talk to you forever my I dear know. Sadly, we're out of time, okay. but um, please let everybody know where they can find you online, where they can get your book and all the good stuff that you're putting out. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Danielle De La Valle. Uh, I'm mostly either on my website or Instagram at Danielle De La Valle NTP. And my book is on Amazon. It's in Kindle, paperback, um, and audiobook, which I narrated myself. That's cool. <laughs> and my final question is, what is the superpower that you have? Or what is your superpower? I would say my superpower is how I make people feel when they're around me. I, I, I recognize that, I honor that, and I humble brag about that because I really make people feel comfortable in my presence. And so that makes me feel really special that I was born with that superpower, so. That's amazing. Yeah. Guys, guys, it really is her superpower. Like, no joke, we've just met for the first time here on set. And when I say I, clicked with this woman immediately she made me feel so comfortable that she really is that really is her superpower please go back listen to all the incredible things this woman has just said because it's not about really having it all or knowing that you're perfect right now but it is about being realistic about what that happiness actually looks like so if you've just set yourself a new year's resolution or some formal goal that you're looking to reach just remember that it's not about the the exterior it's all about how you feel about yourself when you look in that mirror that is the most important thing so go check out all this incredible stuff this woman is doing 
doing. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, click that subscribe button. If you're not following me at Lisa Bilyeu, go check out all of that good stuff. And until next time, guys, go be the hero of your own life. Thank you very much. What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.